and welcome back to New Rockstars. I'm Jessica Clemens, and I'm here to talk and break down Zack Kreger's recent horror flick, Barbarian. Warning, I will be spoiling this movie, like, right now, so turn away if you haven't seen it yet. There's no better way to summarize this movie other than insane. It's like Texas Chainsaw Massacre meets Don't Breathe meets The Hills Have Eyes. Zack Kreger has been working on getting this movie to the big screen for just about 10 years now. And if you don't know Kreger's work, let me tell you, he's one of five members of Whitest Kids You Know, Star of Miss March, or you might have seen him on TBS's Wrecked. Either way, this is his big first solo outing as a writer-director, and I'd say he did a phenomenal job. What I love most about Kreger when doing this movie is he never made an outline. He just wrote what he wanted to see happen next, which which you can kind of see in the movie. So he really didn't think about it too deeply, which gives us all the more reason to theorize and use his interviews to decode what we saw. This movie follows Tess Marshall, played by Georgina Campbell. And if she looks familiar, that's because it's Amy from season four, episode four of Black Mirror's Hang the DJ. I love the love episodes of Black Mirror, they're the best. She encounters Keith Toshko, played by Bill Skarsgård, who only plays creepy and sketchy characters. Pennywise, the kid, Roman, the list goes on. So we're already led to believe he's up to no good, especially with that sus behavior, but I digress. They both accidentally reserve the same Airbnb. Later, all hell breaks loose. We jump to our second act where we're introduced to our new character, AJ, played by sweet Justin Long, who's not sweet in this movie. He owns said Airbnb, and when he arrives, oh boy, does more hell break loose. There's a feral-minded incest baby, some dark, dark histories, and violent outbursts. This movie goes, well, Madison says it best. At first it was fun, then scary, then fun again, then spooky but in a fun way. We open the film to heavy rain and we see Tess in her car. We hear screams, the same screams that play when we get the title card for the movie. The title card is purple, matching the hidden basement room, that room that was playing the breastfeeding video on a loop. What we learn about this house is horrific. It's revealed that this house in the 80s was owned by Frank, played by Richard Drake, AKA the Night King. Though the quaint suburbs used to be oh so sweet, Frank spent the better part of his life stalking, kidnapping, and assaulting women on camera in his makeshift catacomb. When asked in an interview with the writer-director, Zach Kreger, who made the catacomb, he replied, in my head, he built them. After 40 years, the house has been turned into an Airbnb with modern decor, and the horrors that lie underneath have been hidden behind this one cement wall door. The meet cute between Keith and Tess is great once you get past the fact that Bill Skarsgård is not the monster of the movie, which unfortunately doesn't hit until after he dies. At first, our red flags were soaring, flying, going off about this guy. And if you're wondering why she ignored the red flags, Zach Kreger drew inspiration from the book Gift of Fear by Gavin De Becker. Gavin De Becker. Becker, Gavin D. Becker. If you don't know him, Gavin is the author and security consultant mainly for the government and public figures. He investigated stalkers from Olivia Newton-John to Cher. He's written a ton of books on violence prevention, how to be safe, and appeared on a ton of TV shows about it. So what I'm just trying to say is this man knows red flags. In an interview with Trevor Shan, Kreger said there was a chapter in the book that was really primarily directed towards women, and he was encouraging women to pay attention to these little minor red flags that men can give off in day-to-day -day situations. He finished saying, I just wanted to write a scene where I could load as many of those little tiny red flags into an interaction as possible, which we see. It turns out that Keith seemingly gives off every bad vibe, but actually isn't that much of a bad guy. He's just a musician that works for the Lion Tamers, a group of artists that seek out housing, I'm assuming to build communities, and he's currently looking at Brightmore in Detroit, Michigan. Tess is there for an interview to help research for a new documentary about jazz in Detroit. When Tess is unpacking in the bedroom, Keith leaves his wallet out on the table, and we find out he's from Springs, New York, and that he's 5'10", which is a bold-faced lie, because we all know Skarsgård is like 6'4". Anyways, I digress. That night, Tess and Keith are talking about Tess's bad relationship she's trying to get out of with her controlling boyfriend, presumably the man that's nonstop calling her Marcus. When having this heart to heart, they dive into why if Tess was inside and Keith out, she wouldn't have let him in. Clearly we know that women do take precautions in most unfamiliar situations. More specifically, Keith wouldn't have seen the danger and walked in without thinking twice. This foreshadowing is seen later when Tess, who is doing whatever it takes to survive safely, and AJ, who is truly blind to all danger because he is dangerous. Once they go to bed, Tess's door opens slightly, she jumps out of bed, and in the background you see the door of the basement close and maybe a possible figure, which I think could have been done by the mother. The man told us, and we saw she came out at night, so she was just making her normal rounds. That same man later mentioned something along the lines of, the mother isn't the only one down there, and yes, Frank is also down there. People are wondering if there could be more incest children or women he abducted, but we don't know. And Kreger mentions in an interview that he's not interested right now in doing a prequel, so we'd have to see it in a sequel, but I think they would have to come out during all that commotion, so it may just well be just 
Frank and the mother down there. Now, I know this is a bit of a jump, but I wanna jump to AJ's story because this is when a lot of information comes up. AJ is played by Justin Long, and this will be the second time we see this man's eyes gouged out in a movie. AJ has been accused of sexually assaulting his castmate Megan, played by Zach Craig's wife, AKA Aquamarine, AKA Sarah Paxton. Sarah also played the narrator of the breastfeeding video. The article that drops about the assault is from The Hollywood Reporter, who Craig said it wouldn't have been authentic if it wasn't The Hollywood Reporter. And the article is written by Kim Masters, an editor that publishes a ton of articles for The Hollywood Reporter. AJ is a lot. He's been accused of sexual assault. He confirms the sexual assault at the bar with his old friend Everett, who's played by the writer-director Zach Kreger. Originally, they reached out to Zach Efron to play AJ's role because Kreger said, I was thinking I want some kind of beefcake kind of himbo. Later, when Efron rejected the role, he came to terms saying, someone disarming and charismatic as Justin Long seems more engaging. When he's singing Ricky Tiki Tavi, yeah, I believe he's hella disarming too. Also, Chad's come in all different shapes and sizes. It just works well. This character goes throughout the entire movie overly confident, threatening to pull a gun he doesn't have on an intruder in his basement, yelling at almost everyone he talks to, measuring said basement to upsell it. Tess's fear in discovering the basement contrasts AJ's excitement in selling it completely. This goes back to the foreshadowing I mentioned earlier. We find out Tess has been in the basement for two weeks after AJ yells at Bonnie, the realtor overseeing it. I, I, I guess she's just been drinking that hair milk bottle. I don't know. I'm also not a realtor, but including your basement and your square foot when selling a house varies state to state. In GLA, FHA, HUD guidelines say finished basements and unfinished attic areas are not included in the total gross living area. So I guess including it isn't really an issue for the dumbass that is AJ. Either way, while AJ is captured and being forced to breastfeed while our girl Tess gets out, but not before we see the sweet suburb flashback of the home. Like I said earlier, there lived Frank the monster. And the contrast of this messy but sweet little 80s house was completely changed once we heard the screaming from the basement. Frank's neighbor, Doug, tells him how he's leaving due to the neighborhood going to shit. Brightmore in the 1970s was populated from 26,000 but declined to 9,000. Many of the black and white longtime residents witnessed and experienced extreme neighborhood violence, including arson, shootings, and home invasions. So over time in the film, we can see why people are moving out of this seemingly nice neighborhood. The camera angles in the flashbacks are intense and amazing. Kreger pulled from the 1983 Austrian film, Angst, where they used a Snorri cam. Snorri cam? Eee, Snorri cam. Mounted to you and followed you around. Here they used a steady cam with a 12 millimeter lens and rolled around Frank to make him feel like an alien occupying our familiar suburban place. Unfortunately, we see how Frank abducts his victims, one following her home to pose as Carlos, the Detroit power and water guy, and unlocks their bathroom windows, kidnapping them eventually. The woman he's stalking clearly didn't make it out because we see her dress years, years, years later after the abduction in the basement room. We also learn later that Frank has been assaulting women, their offsprings, and the situation continued for God knows how long. The mother is an offspring of Frank and has only known two lives. The abusive, violent life with Frank and the happy mother lovingly smothering her baby in the tapes, which makes sense for her violent tendencies and fear to go near Frank's room. The man playing the mother is actor Matthew Patrick Davis. Zach Kreger and Davis did a lot of research into feral children to help build the mother. In their research, they found that if you are not exposed to any language by the age of two, you're never going to be verbal. Is this word monosyllabic? Monosyllabic? Monosyllabic. Monosyllabic. Wait. Say it again. Monosyllabic. Okay. Monosyllabic. If you don't do it at the crucial age, you will be monosyllabic. So the way she speaks in the movie is true to the character. We see the horrific tapes of the victims Frank has taken, and they're labeled each horribly, whether it's by their physical features, ethnicity, or just occupation. He made sure to note them all, which is common for serial killers to keep some sort of memory of their victims. AJ watches one of Frank's videos and is shaken to his core. This like paradoxical irony that AJ and Frank's mutual abuse and misogyny hits really hard because AJ thinks of Frank as a a monster and a horrible person, which yeah, he is, but they both share that same behavior that they can possess, dominate, or just influence women. They're both awful and similar and their own ways. Kreger even mentioned putting AJ to a moral test in the movie and he completely failed. This really was the last nail in the coffin to confirm that this movie is heavily focused on men and their unconcerning privilege that's dangerous and goes unnoticed, usually by them. While most of the male characters are killed, Tess does survive solely for playing to the mother's undying nature to be a mom. Both characters have been wounded, abandoned, and betrayed by the movie's true antagonist men. Kreger wanted the mother to be the most sympathetic character and she ends the movie that way, booping Tess's nose one last time as her baby. Oh, it was such a weird, sad scene. That's my little breakdown wrap up of Barbarian. The movie was wild and I liked it, but it wouldn't feel right ending my breakdown without acknowledging how triggering and horrible the actions are portrayed in the movie. So if you or anyone you know has been a victim of sexual assault, help is always available. You can visit the Rape, Abuse and Incest National Network website or contact Rain's National Helpline at 1-800-656-HOPE 
help or that's 1-800-656-4673. You can get 24 seven support. Follow me on Instagram and Twitter at Lulu underscore Clemens. Follow New Rockstars. Subscribe to New Rockstars for more horror content. Check out The Break Room where we'll be talking about all kinds of horror content in October. Thanks for watching. And remember, never go into a creepy basement in an Airbnb, folks. Jeez Louise.